we've been caught short. We've got a large capability gap in our defence force. Tonight on 7.30, Australia's rust bucket armada. Did the Navy brass mislead the Defence Minister? The whole future plan for Navy uh, appears to me to be institutionalised chaos. And Westpac's Gail Kelly backs carbon trading but says three years is too long to fix a price. Look, a, a year? <laughs> I don't want to give a particular time frame on it really, but, but certainly as quickly as we can get to an actual trading scheme, we think that would be best. Welcome to the program. It's great to have you come. The Department of Defence has a long-standing reputation for waste, mismanagement and a lack of accountability. Tonight, 7.30 has a close look at one recent case. Why were the Navy's key transport ships missing in action over summer as Cyclone Yassi bore down on the Queensland coast? To give some context first, though, the Defence Department makes one of the biggest calls on the public purse, $27 billion this financial year. There are currently 11 defence projects with a combined worth of $10 billion running over time and over budget. For example, there's the Wedgetail Airborne Early Warning Aircraft, approved 14 years ago and still not airworthy. There are the Overland Field Vehicles, constantly delayed and still at testing stage. And the Collins Class Submarines with huge maintenance issues. Over summer, the Defence Minister's patience with his department was tested to its limits when he was repeatedly told that the only available transport ship was seaworthy when it wasn't. 7.30 can confirm the HMAS Tobruk was so riddled with rust that in places its hull was just two millimetres thick. Here's Hayden Cooper. At Sydney's Garden Island Naval Base, three of the nation's most crucial defence assets sit idle. These are the Navy's ageing hulks, the heavy lift transport ships that put troops on the ground around the world. So it's a pretty important vessel for not only the Navy but the entire Defence Force? Yeah, massive for, for Australia. But if these ships are the very backbone of the force, how is it that all three were out of action at the same time, just as Cyclone Yasi was threatening North Queensland? We've been caught short. We've got a large um, capability gap in our Navy. We've got a large capability gap in our Defence Force. And, uh, and it leaves us with um, the question of how did this happen and, uh, and how are we going to fix it? The whole future plan for Navy uh, appears to me to be institutionalised chaos. As the cyclone brewed off the coast, the government started preparing and defence support was vital. On three occasions, the minister was told HMAS Tobruk was ready to respond, but it never was. It's very difficult to say uh, whether lies were told, whether incorrect advice was given, um, but at the very least there's a communications problem there. I have some sympathy for the minister. He has been misled. After six months in charge, Stephen Smith has set out to take a hard line with the defence chiefs and bureaucrats. And even his opponent blames the department, not him. He's exasperated and I share his exasperation. A warning of all this trouble for Australia's amphibious fleet has been on the radar since September, when HMAS Canimbla and Manura were docked for routine checks. The results were not good. Serious work was needed to repair gearboxes and rust. So serious that rumours started to spread. These two ships are extensively corroded. People tell me they could punch their fists through bulkheads. Well, people have told you that, but they haven't told me, uh, Senator. It wasn't the only alarming piece of news. It soon emerged that HMAS Canimbla had come perilously close to disaster when it lost power in Sydney Harbour. With more than 200 sailors and a $90 million helicopter on board, the Canimbla was just 20 metres away from foundering on the rocks. Opposition spokesman David Johnston has uncovered details of the incident. The emergency was so serious that the skipper of the vessel, the commanding officer of the vessel, called um, civilian tugboats to come and assist them. 
Now, for Navy to have to ring up and call in an emergency civilian um, assistance, call for a, civi a civilian assistance, I think underlines how perilous the situation was. Both ships were taken out of service. The Canimbla for 18 months, the Manura for good. 7.30 has been given the first access to the Navy workhorses, though the areas of significant damage were kept off limits. It's not good to see a ship go out this way. We, um, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all happy with what we've done and what we've achieved being on here. The move leaves the Navy with just one active heavy transport ship. Uh, HMS Brook, welcome on board. Thanks. But 7.30 can now reveal the extent of the sorry state of the nation's last option. While Tobruk was never called on to respond to the cyclone, the ABC has confirmed that it was in no fit state to sail. In some places its hull was so corroded, it was just two millimetres thick when it should have been at least ten. The best advice was it would need two and a half months in dry dock, but under pressure from its minister when it couldn't supply another ship, Defence demanded it be ready in 24 hours. So a steel plate was welded to the hull in an emergency patch-up job. Defence and the crew on board now assure the minister that the Tobruk is back in the water, ready for action. 48 and 8 hours for uh, us means uh, we're like a totally called spring ready to pounce at any given moment. Anything happens and, and you're gone. Correct. We're ready to go. James Brown is a former army officer and now a defence analyst with the Lowy Institute. To him, the news of Tobruk's state of disrepair is no surprise. Well, Navy uh, amphibious ships are particularly prone to rust and corrosion because they have seawater inside as well as outside. And these are old ships. There's been concerns in Navy about the ability of Tobruk to keep going, to keep operating and to carry us through for uh, a number of years. So who then is responsible for the state of the fleet and the incorrect advice to the minister? That advice about the readiness of the Tobruk came from the Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Russ Crane. I want some accountability. I think the minister wants some accountability. He's got to go and get it. How? Well, I think he's got to analyse when someone says something to him. If it's not true, then the person that says it... Um, you know, has to bear some responsibility. So are you saying the Chief of Navy should be sacked? Well, if the Chief of Navy is giving advice on such an important issue as to amphibious shift lift in the face of a serious cyclone in North Queensland and that information is not true, I think it speaks for itself. Hayden Cooper with that report. And we did approach both the Chief of Navy and the Head of the Defence Force to be interviewed for tonight's report, but both declined. Let's cross now to our political editor, Chris Yulman in Canberra. Chris, has Defence Administration been accountable? Well, Lee, I'm sure that there are many people inside the Department of Defence who would say that they are accountable, but I think there's a broader question. What does accountability mean in the Department of Defence? And to discuss that, I'm joined by the Defence Minister, Stephen Smith. Welcome to 7.30. Pleasure, Chris. Why did the Chief of Navy tell you that Tobruk was ready to sail when it wasn't? Well, I think that's, uh, with respect, a bit of a pejorative analysis of the advice that I received on the Tobruk. The disappointing feature of the advice, and I've made my disappointment clear both publicly and privately, was the advice that uh, saw Tobruk's condition deteriorate quite rapidly. Uh, I asked uh, for the state of the Tobruk. I was told that it was uh, within 48 hours operational readiness. And then it, when it went into uh, dry dock to put itself into a full state of preparedness for the potential of Cyclone Yasi, the device deteriorated from that point in time and it's only been recently when I've been advised that uh, as from the 27th of February it's ready for uh, on 48 hours but, uh, notice. But is that acceptable to you? Well what is not acceptable is that we have a very clear gap in our heavy lift uh, amphibious capability and that's why in response to this issue I've required three things of Navy and the Defence Force. Firstly uh, I have imposed a independent review by Paul Rizzo so that we can make some reforms to ensure this never happens again. This is the second time we've seen this uh, over a period of a quarter of a century. Secondly, to require an urgent uh, plan to make up that capability gap and that's why you've seen from the beginning of this year me talk in terms of 
a United Kingdom Bay class as a possibility and also closer sure. cooperation with, with, uh, with New Zealand. But and thirdly, look, Minister, we, go on, sorry. Do, I'll just say thirdly, in doing this, I want to make sure that I don't leave effectively the same legacy for my successors as has been left with respect to the uh, the uh, Canimbla, the Menorah, and the Tobruk. We're Minister, dealing all, here all with of that is understood. That all of that is understood. Yeah, it's, it's, historic, it's an historic issue. But the question is: Is it acceptable that you should be told a ship is ready when it isn't? And are there any consequences well, for that? Well, I in the end, as the Minister for Defence, I'm the one who is accountable to the public, and that's why I've taken the action that I have referred to. So far as defence itself is concerned, there's no doubt that senior officials, whether it's the Chief of the Defence Force himself, the Chief of Navy, the Secretary or the Chief Executive Officer of the Defence Materiel Office, all also have to accept responsibility. And what does that no mean? What does that mean? What are the consequences what, of those actions? Yeah, well, what, what that means is we need to urgently make sure that we put a reform program into place so that this type of uh, incident doesn't occur again. But secondly, we urgently put in place uh, what we need to cover the capability gap until the arrival of the so-called landing helicopter docks All right. in the we'll middle come to that of, in a uh, of this decade. Is the Tobruk available today? The advice I have as at today is that the Tobruk continues to be available on 48 hours notice and, uh, and readiness for sea and that's been the case since the 25th of February. And the advice is the same from the same people that told you last time so you have confidence in that advice? Well, I have confidence in that advice until such time as uh, I get different advice and I've made the point both internally and publicly that one of the very serious issues of concern so far as the Tobruk, the, the Tobruk was concerned was the deteriorating advice in a rapidly short space of time. All right, now this ship, the, the replacements for these ships don't come in online till four, for four years. What are you going to do in between now and then because this ship will not be on 48 hours for the next four years? Well, that's true, and that's why I've been saying since the beginning of this year that we have to look at uh, alternative options. I'm leaving Australia early tomorrow for the United Kingdom. I'll be having further discussions with the UK Defence Secretary about the possibility of Australia leasing or purchasing a Bay-class amphibious lift which is available from the United Kingdom. But we also have uh, all other options on the table, including, as we have in the past, the historic past, the use potentially of commercial options available in Australia, whether they're catamarans or trimarans. So we are exploring every option because, as you correctly point out, and, I have, and as I have appreciated for some time, we cannot proceed uh, with confidence that the Tobruk will always be available. Finally, finally and very briefly, Minister, how can we have confidence in the Navy, which will get an enormous amount of money over the next few years to build up its capability if it can't manage the kit that it's got now? Well, we need to ensure that we continue with the reform program that this government has put in place. Forever and a day we've had capability difficulties in defence, procurement and acquisition capabilities, and we've put in place reform programs over the last three or four years to improve that, but there's a lot more work to be done. The single most important thing we can do and bring to defence is to substantially improve the personal and institutional accountability uh, that goes with the making of decisions. And uh, together with the Defence Materiel right. Minister Jason Clare, I'll be bringing right. forward such a program over the next few months. Stephen Smith, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much.